Our next speaker is Dr. Jocelyn Godwin. And we're very fortunate to have him here. It's his first year at CPAC. And he's uh, the only person that uh, is giving a class on Atlantis, an accredited class in a major university right now. So that's one calling. But uh, he's written a number of books, and I've had a chance to read two of them. And I, I sense there uh, just a, a deep uh, reverence for the esoteric teachings that go back through millennium. And so I'm looking forward to hearing his talk. I haven't seen or heard a word of it. So will you please give a warm welcome to Professor Jocelyn Godwin. Thank you, and thank you, Walter, for asking me and for introducing me. I'm going to, this is a little too, too loud, isn't it? Is it not too loud? Because I don't want to talk too loudly. I have had a cold and I'll lose my voice if I shout. So um, if you can hear me, I'll start like this, right? Uh, my talk follows quite nicely on to where Robert Schock ended because he was talking about the paranormal and aspects of our subjects and our studies that go beyond the rational and the scientific, uh, or let's say that the rational and the scientific start, uh, stop short of them. Well, in our studies, um, which I call Atlantis, by the way, just because it's the most convenient one-name term for the question of high civilizations or high cultures in prehistoric times, no matter whether it's Plato's Atlantis or somebody else's, that's a code word, code word for the hypothetical existence of high culture in prehistoric times, which goes, of course, against the accepted view. In our study of this, um, most of um, the approaches use what Walter Sullivan called the hardware of physical remains, especially stones, and the software of myths, especially numbers that come in myths. And with those Obviously, the, pro the subject is making great progress, and there seems every evidence that there was indeed Atlantis, whatever we want to describe it or define it as. But I'm going to talk about a third uh, avenue towards knowledge of this, which is, uh, broadly speaking, the paranormal uh, avenue. And uh, again, I have to define what I mean by paranormal. I mean people who claim to have had some sort of knowledge of high culture in prehistoric times, that is not simply uh, through the five senses and the rational mind, but which comes usually through one of four channels. It comes through intuition, in which somebody just feels convinced of a certain truth about the past and then follows it up, very often with scientific backing. Intuition, then there's initiation, which is uh, when one claims that one belongs to some secret society or initiatic line that has passed down secret knowledge, knowledge that's been reserved from the general public. But um, one has somehow got hold of this initiatic knowledge. One has somehow plugged into a tradition. And the third way is um, through channeling, where somebody purports to be a mouthpiece for a source of higher knowledge. And the last one is clairvoyance, where somebody claims that they can actually see into the past and describe it as if they were seeing it as we're seeing each other now. So through intuition, initiation, channeling, and clairvoyance, we have a huge range of occult approaches to this subject, uh, far too many to distill into this talk, which I'm going to try to end a little early so that we won't run behind. Uh, I'm going to talk about two, two, two currents. Uh, first of all, the French esoteric current, and second, the theosophical one. And I'm going to be mentioning just the main characters in each of these, each of whom is a study in himself, and many of whose books are available, 
um, and some of whose books are indeed in our shop today. Uh, the, French, the French esoteric tradition, very, very big thing in, in the French intellectual world, much more so that it, than in the English or the American. Um, very influential on French poets, novelists, and thinkers in general. Uh, but for our subject, this starts with uh, a non-occultist, actually. It starts with an astronomer called Jean-Sylvain Bailly, who lost his head in the French Revolution, so that dates him. And Bailly uh, was trying to work out where humanity had come from. And he was doing this through a combination of reading myths and doing hard science. Uh, so using the, the two conventional means of, ex, uh, of exploring the past. And he came to the conclusion, I don't have to explain how or why, that the, uh, the bearers of culture, the bearers of knowledge, mathematics, um, technology and everything, had come from the North Pole. They'd come from a homeland in the North Pole, which had become uninhabitable when the Earth's axis shifted. Uh, that had moved them into an unpleasantly cold zone, and they'd had to leave, and they come south in all directions. And he describes how they set up civilizations at various points of their southward descent. So he planted this idea in the minds of the French esotericists of um, a race of wise people, an advanced race coming down from the polar or the Arctic regions. And this was picked up by Fabre d'Olivet, who is one of the most important figures in this particular current. Fabre d'Olivet, who um, wrote what he called a philosophic history of the human race. And this began with this idea of uh, a wise race coming down from the pole. He said that this was uh, one of four races which had populated the globe and which had each had a different origin. He was, he, he was not a monogenesis, monogeneticist. He thought that humanity had appeared in four different places which had given birth to the white, the red, the yellow, and the black races, and that each of them had their own history. Uh, people don't think like that today, but there's a, a very strongly um, racialist, let's say, not racist, but racialist thinking in all these early Atlantean theorists. So for Fabre d'Olivet, um, each race had had its own history. The black race had been the dominant race for thousands of years, and he believes had enslaved most of the, most of, uh, the world's lands. And then came the, the, the turn of the red race, which was the Atlantean race, and which uh, was almost exterminated in the great cataclysm of Atlantis, whereupon the white race came into its own and became the Europeans, about whose history he writes in his two-volume book on the philosophical history since that time. So he, he's already planted several ideas. Um, the ideas of separate development of the races, the ideas of a polar origin. Um, he was also, uh, he read the, the Indian scriptures in their very early translations, and he was interested in the yugas, but he had the most extraordinary view of the four yugas. He turned them upside down. He said the Satya Yuga was the worst of them, when people were just sort of struggling to make it in a physical environment. And then the Treta Yuga, they do a little better. Then in the, in, in the Dvapara and the Kali Yuga, which brings him up to his own time, people are really mastering their environment, and uh, they are generally happier times. So he's an optimist. He thinks the Yugas go in an upward direction, and that um, it points to a bright, progressivist future. He, w he probably thought this up in opposition to Rousseau, who said that the happiest time of the human race was when we were noble savages in the distant past. For Fabre d'Olivet, noble savages had a, a dreadful time, and the civilized inhabitants of Paris, like himself, were doing much better in, in his present day. So he becomes almost canonical for the French esotericists. His works are obviously not very, well, not very widely distributed, but they're read and studied. And they're picked up towards the end of the century by another most important figure, Saint-Yves d'Alvedre. You would see his masterwork in the bookshop there. Um, it's just appeared in English. And Saint-Yves d'Alvedre uh, took Faber d'Olivet's scheme, um, complete with Atlantis, complete with the story of the races, 
but he added a couple of interesting twists to it. He thought that the Atlanteans, after they ended, had transferred their center to Central Asia, where, they had an, where their, an underground kingdom had been formed, the kingdom of Agatha. Again, Santiv's book on Agatha has recently been published in English. And from this uh, spiritual center, they sent out the impulses, the, the spiritual impulses and the great initiates who founded the religions and who guided the evolution, the spiritual evolution of the human race. Santiv, too, was something of, a, of, of an optimist because he saw everything as culminating in the great initiate who was Christ. He was, a, he was a Roman Catholic somehow at the same time as believing that Rama and Krishna and Orpheus and Moses and Pythagoras and Fohi had all been great initiates in their times. So for Santiv, this spiritual center in Central Asia was the inheritor of the previous cycle of Atlantean initiation and wisdom and uh, remained to his day because he purported to have visited it in an astral travel state uh, and to, uh, to have described it in terms um, that are really quite comical. He says that the, the, the Agatians are far more advanced than we are. They have railroads, they have flying machines, they have all our libraries, they know everything we're doing, they take our newspapers, and one day they'll pop out from under the earth and then they'll put us right. So that was Santiv's take on it. Now, his work, um, difficult to read, and again, not that much distributed, um, passed into the hands of Edouard Churet. Churet was a literateur, a very good writer, and he turned the whole thing into a best-selling volume called The Great Initiates, and told basically the same story that Fabre d'Olivet and Santiv d'Alvedra had told, the story of the fall of Atlantis, the transference of its wisdom, um, which was uh, the, the transference of its wisdom, in his case, to Egypt. He felt that the Atlantean refugees had settled in Egypt. They built the Sphinx, they built the pyramids in an antediluvian time. And uh, they were the first of a series of initiates, Rama, Krishna, Moses, Orpheus, Pythagoras, and especially Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus being the mythical priest king of Egypt and the mythical author of uh, hermetic writings. And Shure's, Shure's work uh, came at the right time. It came at the end of the 19th century when people were beginning to uh, think about world, wisdom on a world scale. Wisdom as not being just the preserve of the Christian West, not just the um, uh, culmination of a rising process of uh, improving philosophers, but in which people were beginning to look all around the world for sources of wisdom, and Oriental wisdom especially was getting translated and becoming available. This mainly thanks to the Theosophical Society, of which more in a moment. So Shure was a popularizer of this. He had, all the, ra he had the racial stuff, he had the, the polar origin of, of um, the present-day Europeans, he had the conflicts of the races, he had this overarching benevolent force which sent the world a series of great initiates and had been doing so since Atlantis and presumably ever since hum humanity had existed on the globe. Now after him, uh, René Guénon is the next person and he's a crucial figure in this whole story. Guénon started his life among the French occultists doing table tapping and um, mixing with the sort of people who read Saint-Yves d'Alvedra, who read Churet and uh, people like Papus, if you've heard of him. But fairly soon, Guénon took a more serious turn, and he became the founder of what's called traditionalism, or some people call it perennialism, which is the doctrine that there has been a primordial revelation to humanity of all the wisdom that's necessary to know, and that it's been repeated in various ways, in various times and places, in ways accommodated to the understanding and the nature of different peoples. And Guénon pushes the thing back quite a way. He, he, he writes especially about uh, the relationship of what he now calls Hyperborea, the Arctic civilization, and the Atlantean one. He says that um, the center of wisdom on Earth uh, 
is always the same place geographically, and currently it's this underground land in Central Asia. But as the Earth shifts in its, around its axis, so the spiritual center takes up different positions relative to us on Earth. And he says originally, in our s s time cycle, it was at the pole. It was literally at the North Pole. And that was the seat of the Hyperborean, or primordial tradition, which for him was the first revelation for our cycle. It's probably some 60,000 years ago, according to his, uh, his numerical scheme. And then came the Atlantean one. And then the Atlantean one came to Egypt, and the Hyperborean one somehow filtered down through the Celtic peoples. And uh, without covering the details, th this is enough to, to, to show the ideas behind Guénon's conception. He thinks of the continents continually rising and falling, each continent carrying a new tradition and a new, a new humanity in a way. And um, he sees it all in a very downward way. He sees the yugas in the traditional Hindu way as a declining spiritual impulse that starts with the Golden Age, goes to the silver, the bronze, the iron, and he sees us as being almost at the end of the iron age. But in his version, which is, as I say, the traditional one, what comes next is another Golden Age, because I think he really envisaged the complete destruction of, of today's humanity or the virtual destruction and then the remnants start again in some kind of Edenic state. Uh, all the traditionalists see it this way. They all see the modern age as the absolute tail end, the absolute worst uh, state of humanity possible, and the only uh, rescue being not a, uh, not a gradual curve upward, but a sudden caesura and a, a new start in a new, in a new consciousness, I suppose. Uh, now, Guénon, um, he's mostly been translated into English. His works aren't very much read. They're, they're not that difficult to read. He's very, very precise, very pure. He can be rather wordy, but um, he's seldom ambiguous. And he writes, um, uh, I think, such important works about metaphysics. Uh, if you read his metaphysical works, like The Symbolism of the Cross or The Multiple States of Being, um, it really gives you a a philosophical matrix that makes a lot of things come clear, at least that's my experience. I'm always glad I read, read Guénon long ago when I did, before I read a lot of other things. Um, I don't agree with him, that matters not, neither to him nor to, nor to you, but um, he's an immensely valuable writer uh, as, as an educator, I think, to, to pass through the traditional viewpoint and to test one's own opinions against it. Uh, so we, we'll leave him as the end of this, uh, this French tradition of Atlantis and turn to the Theosophical one, which concentrates less on the past 10,000 years and more on the actual state of Atlantis itself. Now, Theosophy, as you probably know, um, is an old word, but it took on a different meaning when H.P. Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society in 1875 and then started pouring out her voluminous works. And as far as Atlantis is concerned, um, it's part of uh, a large theosophical scheme that, again, I'll sketch very briefly. Uh, Blavatsky explains, and you'll find this in her secret doctrine, that um, the story of humanity on the globe is the story of the, pres of the, the progressive descent into material bodies and into the physical state, and ascent again out of it. And that this takes place through a series of seven what she calls root races. Now these are not the same as the, the, the colored uh, distinctions of race that the French have talked about. These are waves of humanity of all different um, physical races. The important thing is the, their, their, state, their state of materiality, I think. The first two, she says, weren't even in material bodies. They were more like uh, astral bodies or bodies of mist or something like that, so you wouldn't even see them. And those, she says, are the ones that ap appeared at the poles in the, in the very earliest years. And she, st she, she stretches the whole thing back millions of years. The French only consider usually tens of thousands of years as their limit, but Blavatsky immediately pushes back, pushes it back, to 
the time of the great dinosaurs is when they usually imagine these infant humans as having come down in a not yet materialized state. So the, the first two root races are not material. Then in the, what she calls the Lemurian age, which is the third age, they begin to have um, more solidity in their bodies. And she describes this in, in somewhat grotesque terms as astral giants and uh, beings which reproduce by eggs or by, by splitting like amoebas. And then gradually, as the Lemurian age goes on, they become more physical and they, they divide into sexes and they begin to reproduce normally. Uh, but, uh, but still, they are not materialized enough to leave any remains. Uh, only at the Atlantean age, do they, which is the fourth age, do they achieve full physicality. So that's when you first meet beings like ourselves, uh, at least material like, like ourselves. And um, Blavatsky herself didn't, well, it's hard to know, I was going to say she didn't generate this Atlantean law herself, but it all depends what you think the Theosophical Masters were, because this was all first outlined in a series of mysterious letters from beings calling themselves Kuthumi and Moria, who wrote letters to Blavatsky's associates. And they were delivered in phenomenal ways. They're written in phenomenal ways. I've looked at them in the British Museum. They're very extraordinary documents, just physically. And uh, these are what first outlined the, the scheme of root races and the state of, uh, of human beings in Atlantis and in later root races. So I suppose if, if it was a phenomenon generated by Blavatsky, then she was responsible for it. But if it came from some other beings, then I suppose it's a case of channeling, a rather unusual case delivered in envelopes and written on paper. But anyway, that's, that, that's a question for us theosophical historians to try to wrestle with. Who wrote these letters? Who invented this scheme? And what are, where does it come from? But that became theosophical dogma. The theosophists all accept this idea of the root races, the fourth race, the third race is Lemurian, and probably lived somewhere in the south, uh, the southern ocean around the tail of Africa, uh, between there and Australia, possibly in the Pacific. Nobody's quite sure, because they say that continents have risen and fallen so much you can hardly connect them with present day geographical locations. Blavatsky's Atlantis is more in the Pacific. It's more the area of, um, of Southeast Asia, which she says was occupied by a vast continent that spread as far as Tasmania in its time. So she doesn't have a platonic Atlantis, but she does have Atlantis having colonies all over the world, including in the North Atlantic. She also has a series of cataclysms. She says the first breakup of Atlantis was about 800,000 years ago, and then it broke up bit by bit um, between then and Plato's date, which was the final disappearance of its last fragment. So you can see how, uh, what, what a huge uh, historical uh, telescope she's applying to her, to her system. Blavatsky um, was neither positive, neither positive nor negative in, in her views. She wasn't seeing the yugas as going up like Prabhu Dolive or going down like Rene Guénon and the Hindus. She saw the whole thing as an inevitable uh, uh, progression. Souls come into bodies, they learn the lessons of materiality, they go on to other experiences and are continually cycling through uh, different waves of souls going through the different planets. Uh, it's, it, it's a marvelous uh, cosmological vision, whatever truth may lie behind it. Now, as soon as Blavatsky was dead, her successors uh, began to improve on this, and especially a gentleman whose picture we've already seen, Charles Webster Leadbeater, former Anglican clergyman who became a, a keen theosophist. And he discovered pretty early on that he had clairvoyance, that he could look back into the past and he could read what he called the Akashic Records. That's the records written in the ether, which record everything that ever happened. And he began to write books about Atlantis, full of wonderful circumstantial evidence, describing the Vimanas in which they flew around, describing their gardens, their palaces, their methods of education, uh, 
And he, he would just sit back in an armchair, stare into space and dictate. That's how he did it. He did it in a perfectly waking state, but it's as if, just as you at this moment, can visualize your own home in, the back, in your imaginations while you're, you're still got your eyes open here. He could apparently do this. What he was seeing, um, whether, he, whether his interpretation of it was right or wrong, that's another matter. But he, he wrote these descriptions of the evolution of the human race, a book called Man, How, Why, and Whither, in which he starts way back with the Lemurians and describes their way of life. He describes Atlanteans. He, he's also very interested in the fates of the races and their mixtures together. He sometimes sounds like a chemist, and it's, it, it's, it's rather strange today, where he says that uh, the fourth Atlantean subrace had a dash of of, of white blood and, uh, and, and a large helping of red and, white, red and yellow or something like that. He, he's, uh, um, he's a curious, curious writer. Uh, but the, the, the thing that really drew people into Leadbeater's view of Atlantis was that he read their past lives. He began to construct an immense web of reincarnations for all the people, uh, all the important people, of the Theosophical Society. And especially when Krishnamurti came along and was being trained to become the world teacher, um, he read all his previous incarnations, he read the incarnations of Blavatsky, <coughs> and then he'd connect them all up. And this was thrilling for people, because you know you go to Leadbeater and, and say, no, no, who was I in ancient Egypt? And he'd say, um, oh yes, uh, you were the great uncle of the present Christian, uh, of the then Krishnamurti's great aunt, or something, or you were married to Madame Blavatsky's grandson. Um, and uh, he's, he kept records of these. He had a couple of assistants who'd write this all down in big charts so that he wouldn't go wrong. Um, so they had everybody plotted out where they'd incarnated at the various times. None of them were unimportant people, needless to say. And when, when, when a, um, a new uh, important person would join the society, he'd have to fit them in. He'd have to find another sibling or another spouse for somebody so that they could join the club. Why anybody was taken in by this, I don't know, but it, obviously um, uh, human gullibility has no limits. And Leadbeater was a very persuasive man. And um, uh, so that's, that's the clairvoyant. Uh, approach, or the first example. The second example is Rudolf Steiner, who started as a theosophist, but broke away uh, on two issues. One of them was Leadbeater's uh, moral behavior, which Steiner disapproved of, and the other was the fact that um, Blavatsky was very anti-Christian, and uh, Steiner felt that Christ and the whole Christian event had to be given a, a more important place in the cosmic scheme. Plus, Steiner had his own clairvoyance. He said that this was something that anybody could develop if they would simply practice, practice spiritual science. Um, so if challenged to say, you know, how do I know that you're telling the truth of what you see? He said, follow the same path as me and you will see it. Uh, unfortunately, none of Steiner's followers seem to have developed it to the same degree. Uh, he, he is unique. I mean, he, he is a very great man. Uh, one, he's a genius uh, in many fields, especially education, for example. But um, in his readings, he too gave a complete history of the human race. He, he went even back before Lemuria. And he was interested mo not in races this time. He was interested in, con in the state of consciousness, in the history of human consciousness, and the uh, the, the development of the ego, the development of the different components of the human being. And uh, I mean, w w in my cynical moods, I think of Steiner as reconstructing the whole theosophical cosmology in order to make it lead inexorably uh, in evolutionary steps, first to Western Europe, then to Germany, then to Goethe, and then finally to Steiner himself. Uh, but because uh, everything seems to be pointing that way. But uh, he, was, he was a man of great personal humility. He would have been horrified to, to, to see himself in that light. But this is really how, where his story ends. So he, he did past life readings, but he was sensible enough not to do them for living people. 
He did them for historical figures. He, he, he would tell you who Goethe had been in a past life or who John the Baptist had become in the Middle Ages. But he didn't want to mess with, uh, I mean, he had the horrible example of Leadbeater not to, not to follow. So uh, that, that was how Steiner used the Atlantean thing, as, uh, to describe a stage of human evolution which followed the entry into physical bodies <clears throat> but preceded the formation of, of the ego which we have. He saw the Atlanteans as having had a mastery of physical forces, but not through machinery, uh, through, I suppose, telekinesis or, or, or through some intimate connection with uh, the mechanism of matter. And that's a theme that comes up in many of the occult Atlanteans, that they didn't need the tools we need in order to uh, move enormous stones and so on. After Steiner, uh, I just want to mention one more channel briefly because you've probably heard of Alice Bailey who also started as a theosophist. Uh, she, she was not a clairvoyant herself, but she made her own contact with the theosophical master called Joal Kuhl, or DK, and he, he, he um, dictated her many books to her in a waking state. Again, with eyes open, she would hear the voice or somehow intuit what he wanted to write. And she, she writes <coughs> many pages describing the state of humanity on Atlantis and the doings of the various masters of that time. And she develops this... <coughs> God. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my voice. I have, to, I have to talk a bit lower. She develops this into a, a vast cosmic bureaucracy in which she describes the duties of all the masters and the various nations which they rule, and she brings in astrological uh, considerations. And it seems fitting that uh, she should be the occult philosopher most celebrated at the UN, where her followers have, I believe, a, a meditation room and are quite influential uh, as uh, making a human bureaucracy correspond to the cosmic one, I suppose. Um, I'm cutting this a little short because I, 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 because I started late. Uh, so I won't talk much about Edgar Cayce, uh, the sleeping prophet, uh, again a channeler, but unlike Alice Bailey, an unconscious channeler. When he woke up, he didn't know what he'd said. Um, interesting distinction, that. And I won't talk um, about uh, Ramtha. I wanted to talk about Ramtha as uh, another channeling uh, entity who purports to be a, a, an Atlantean himself, or strictly speaking, a Lemurian from 35,000 years ago who was enslaved by the Atlanteans and uh, emerged from slavery to become uh, the great ruler Ram and conquered half the earth. So we're back to Ram or Rama, whom Fabio Olive was so interested in. Um, Given more time, I, I, I would have uh, quite a lot to say about that and, and modern channeling. But let me just close with um, an independent, somebody who, who doesn't fit in either of these categories, either the theosophical line um, or, the, or the French esoteric line. I, uh, one of the great challenges of anybody interested in esotericism is to read Gurdjieff's All and Everything, a book of over a thousand pages, uh, written uh, specifically to be awkward and difficult and repulsive to read, full of, full of outlandish terms. Um, but I find it very interesting. I don't, I don't claim to be a, a, um, a, a reader of, of this book called Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson, uh, especially not having, read it, having not read it five times, which is what you're meant to do if you want to understand it. But I do find it a very interesting work because it contains a lot of Atlantean law. What, how we're supposed to take it, whether as channeled material or as Gurdjieff's fiction or what, never mind. But it contains, for instance, it contains three sorts of catastrophes. It has a cosmic catastrophe in which a comet hits the Earth and wipes out the first humanity. It has a geological catastrophe in which the Earth's crust adjusts itself, rather like the Hapgood theory, and finds a new point of, uh, of equilibrium. And that one brings an end to Atlantis. 
it has um, a meteorological catastrophe in which great winds, somehow caused by the moon, uh, cause the desert to dry up and, uh, and sand to invade the Sphinx. And um, then it has um, two versions of the, um, the great initiates. One of them is an extraterrestrial, which Beelzebub is, is supposed to be. He describes his six visits to the Earth coming in a spaceship. There's a lot of comedy in all of this. But he's an extraterrestrial, something of a different nature. And he and his crew infiltrate the human race, impersonating them in order to educate them. So there's the von Denikum theory uh, of alien intervention. And then he also has the, the College of Initiates, which he places, first of all, in Africa, and then later they move to Central Asia, which we've met before. And they are, are, are human beings who have somehow trained and become initiates and fit to, to um, pursue their studies and intervene in human affairs as and when they want, which isn't very often. He also has um, two means of penetrating the past. One is called um, legomenism, and he describes this as the way that the Atlantean adepts would pass on to one another knowledge of the distant past. He doesn't explain quite how it works, but that's one, which is rather like tradition, I think. And then he has another, which, if I remember, is called Sorptokalknian perception, or Sorptokalknian consciousness, which he says is the perception of thought tapes planted in the atmosphere by initiates, which can be read by anybody who can develop Sorptokalknian perception. Again, it sounds very much like clairvoyance reading the Akashic records. And finally, he has um, two interesting things about the Great Pyramid. Number one, he places it way, way back, as almost all of these esotericists do, way before, um, uh, the, before the end of the Ice Age. Uh, so in you know, a matter of more like hundreds of thousands of years before the present. And he says... And this really leapt at me, because I, I, I was looking at this the same day as I was reading Robert Schock's book about the gradual build-up of the Great Pyramid. Gurdjieff says that it was originally built with tubes for the observation of celestial entities, and that this became necessary after people had lost the capacity to sense them with, well, what he means, extrasensory perception or clairvoyance. In other words, it was necessary to do that, to observe the heavens after people had lost the natural um, capacity to, to sense them. So there's the tubes, there's the idea of uh, building it first as an observatory and then building it up later. Well, w what does one do with all this stuff? Um, I think that um, I would treat it like you treat Plato, uh, not as gospel truth, but as a stimulus to research. Think of all the interesting researches that Plato's Atlantis story has sparked off, without which we probably wouldn't be talking about this at all. Uh, we don't have to take Plato's story literally, but it's so full of ideas, so full of provocative notions about time, space, um, and the history of the human race, that uh, it makes us think. And uh, to me, these occultists, they don't agree with each other, there's certain places at which they come together, and those, those nodal points, I think, are things that would be worth uh, following up using the hardware and the software uh, of physical remnants and, and myth. Uh, I, I think they open up possibilities for research. They open up our minds to possibilities, for example, just about the population of the human race. How, does it, uh, how do their... Uh, dicta about the races work with um, DNA studies, for example, or how do their calculation of the, uh, the world ages work with our knowledge of precession? Or indeed, if the Earth's been knocked off its kilter once or, or more times, um, maybe does that upset, upset the whole precessional thing? According to some myths, the Earth never did, originally didn't precess. It was upright in its axis, and then a disaster knocked it off of uh, alignment and causes us to have seasons. My book on Ar called Arctos is all about that. Uh, so uh, it, it makes one question some of these accepted views and, and uh, opens up a few alleys that might be worth going down. And besides that, it's really fascinating stuff and um, I find it a lot more entertaining than fiction.
And that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening.